Welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. Here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it's all connected. Today we're going to be talking about a topic that has been requested a lot, and that is Sjogren's Syndrome. What it is, why it can be so confusing, why was I given a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis only to be told later that I have Sjogren's, what in the world is going on, we're going to get into all of it. If this is information that you like, then please hit subscribe, like, and share it. Sharing these videos really helps us get in front of more eyeballs, and we know how difficult it can be to really wrap your head around some of these rheumatology com uh, concepts and diagnosis. So that's what we're here to do. So let's just get into it. All right, so first I just want to set the scene. And if your story is anything similar to this or you relate to any piece of this, just know that you are not alone. So what typically happens is you might go in to see your primary care doctor and you have some joint pain, maybe some fatigue, and you have some blood work done and you get a phone call saying that you have rheumatoid arthritis and you need to see a rheumatologist. And you're like, what? <laughs> So, first of all, you have to wait three to six months to see your rheumatologist, and you start freaking out, doing your due diligence, do, looking up all the things on the internet about rheumatoid arthritis. You look over your own labs, and what the heck, why didn't they even mention that I also have ANA that showed up on my blood work, and oh my god, do I have lupus. And so we go in a tailspin, we finally get in front of the rheumatologist only to be told that we actually have Sjogren's syndrome. Like, what in the world is going on? This story or some version of this story is actually really common. In fact, it can take upwards of three years to come to a correct diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome, which is super frustrating, I know. So let's get into what it is and why that happens. So what is Sjogren's syndrome? Well, like most of my conditions, it is an autoimmune systemic condition. Autoimmune means that your immune system, for reasons we don't really understand, has started to attack your own cells and your own tissues. Systemic meaning it affects the entire body. Now, even though it affects the entire body, there are certain organs that are most commonly affected by Sjogren's. And those organs are the lacrimal glands and the salivary glands. So what, what are those? So these are glands, the lacrimal glands are around the eyes, they help us produce tears, and the salivary glands, including the parotid gland, which is right here, helps us produce saliva. So the autoimmunity causes inflammation in those glands, which then leads to those glands not working right. And when those glands aren't working right, what you can get is dry eyes because you're not able to produce tears and dry mouth because you're not able to produce saliva. In some cases, the parotid gland can become so inflamed that it can actually stick out and become very prominent. Those are the most common symptoms of Sjogren's syndrome. Now, I kind of got a little ahead of myself. Let's just back up just a little bit. Sjogren's syndrome is most commonly seen in women, and specifically women over 40 years old. Now, that certainly doesn't mean that men can't get it and that children can't get it, but by far and away, it is seen in women over 40. So what are some other common symptoms of Sjogren's? Well, we talked about the most common, and the most common being dry eyes and dry mouth. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's not that big of a deal. I can live with that. And yes, you absolutely can. But it's important that you understand that they, those things still need to be tended to. Our tears keep our eyes healthy. They keep us from getting scratches and infections of our eyes. And our saliva keeps our mouth healthy. It keeps our gums and our teeth healthy and protects us against cavities. So if you see your eye doctor or your dentist and they make a note that your eyes or your mouth are particularly dry, you might want to consider getting tested for Sjogren's syndrome. So what are some other things? Well, like I said, it's systemic. So the entire body can be affected. And some of the symptoms can actually be very similar to lupus and rheumatoid arthritis things like fatigue and brain fog, things like skin rashes, 
Photosensitivity. What is that again? That's when your skin is very sensitive to the sun and you not only burn easily, but might actually develop rashes and fatigue and headache after being out in the sun. Joint pain is huge in Sjogren's patients, and it can actually be two different types of joint pain. One type kind of falls more in what I would call the fibromyalgic type pain. It's going to be more muscular, more tendons kind of around the joint. Whereas you can also get inflammatory joint pain where the joint gets big and swollen and tender and hot and red. Both types of pain can be seen with Sjogren's patients. Not as common, but still important for you to know, Sjogren's patients can have problems with their lungs, with their kidneys and with their nervous system. Now, thankfully, these complications from Sjogren's are not as common, but they are still important to keep in mind. And the fact that they're not as common can sometimes delay the time it takes to really appreciate what is going on with a Sjogren's patient. So the nuances of what's going on in the lung, the kidney, and the nervous system is really beyond what I wanted to get into in this video, but it stems from inflammation within those organs, and the symptoms can be very wide ranging. So someone might have headaches, they might have what we call peripheral neuropathy, which is when you get numbness and tingling in your digits. In lung problems, someone might have a cough or shortness of breath. With the kidney problems, oftentimes people don't feel anything and it's something that's caught just on regular blood work. Now, I don't mention any of this to scare anybody, but I do think it's important that you, you know what the possibilities are so that you can keep an eye out and discuss them with your doctor. All right, the, another issue I wanted to get into was this concept of primary versus secondary Sjogren's. Now, you might have heard your doctor, you've either overheard them, or maybe they flippantly just kind of mentioned, oh, you have secondary Sjogren's, it's no big deal, or, or just kind of thrown that term around, and I want to really get into what does that mean. Well, Sjogren's syndrome is oftentimes seen in combination with another autoimmune condition. So rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, lupus, myositis, these conditions can all have a secondary component that is Sjogren's syndrome. And it's an entirely different condition, but they oftentimes can travel together. So when someone has, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, and then they also have dry eyes and dry mouth, it is very common to do further testing and find out that someone has secondary Sjogren's. Now, Sjogren's though can happen in and of itself and just be by itself. And in those cases, you would call it primary Sjogren's. Now, for all practical purposes, whether or not you have primary or secondary Sjogren's doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the treatment. It doesn't change the way we approach it. But just so that you know that Sjogren's oftentimes can be seen with other autoimmune conditions. And so it's important to ask your doctor if you've been diagnosed with Sjogren's, is my Sjogren's primary or secondary? And what tests have you done to confirm this? And are there any other tests that should be done to rule out any other autoimmune conditions? This is especially important if someone is having ongoing inflammatory joint pain. And remember, inflammatory joint pain is when your joints get swollen on you, they can get really boggy and tender to touch, they can feel warm and hot. It's really, that can happen with Sjogren's by itself. It's very important that you also make sure that there isn't a rheumatoid arthritis element to that pain. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right, and then why is Sjogren's so confusing? I don't understand why it had to take five different appointments for me to come to the right diagnosis. I know, I know, I know it can be really, really confusing. So the first thing is, Sjogren's is not necessarily as commonly thought of as often as things like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. So that's the first thing. 
In order to make a diagnosis for Sjogren's, you need a number of factors. Very similar when you're making a diagnosis of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, there isn't just one factor that tells the doctor, oh, this is a Sjogren's patient. It's, do you have the right symptoms? Do you have the right physical exam findings? And do you have the right blood tests? And the blood test oftentimes is what can really confuse people. If you go to see your primary care doctor and you have certain symptoms that they are worried are immune in nature, they're going to do the most common tests that are done, the ANA and the rheumatoid factor. And if you want more information about either one of those, then I would recommend you check out those two videos I've done on those particular tests. And you might have, you know, the ANA is positive, you get told you have lupus. The rheumatoid factor is positive, you get told you have rheumatoid arthritis. But here's the kicker. Both the ANA and the rheumatoid factor are very commonly positive in patients with Sjogren's syndrome. And so if you don't take the next step to do further testing, specifically looking for Sjogren's syndrome, then yeah, you can be confused and think someone has lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So what are those further tests? There's two antibodies that we check, the anti-SSA antibody and anti-SSB antibody. These antibodies are associated with Sjogren's syndrome. Unfortunately, it's not 100%. You can actually have Sjogren's syndrome and have negative antibodies. In fact, upwards of 20 to 30% of Sjogren's syndrome patients will not have antibodies, which makes things even more confusing. But those are the two antibodies that we really rely on to kind of help guide us whether someone has Sjogren's or not. Having a rheumatoid factor, having a positive ANA, those are actually very common to have when you have Sjogren's you got to take that further step, that further testing to really see if someone has Sjogren's syndrome. Now, like I said, you can have 20 to 30 percent of Sjogren's patients with negative labs. Well, what do you do then? Well, then you want to get tissue proof that there's inflammation going on around the glands. And the way we do that is with a lit biopsy. We call it a minor salivary gland biopsy, where an ENT specialist can go in and take a little tissue from your lip, look at it under the microscope, and see if there's any inflammation going on around those glands. Now, yes, it is an invasive procedure, so anytime you do anything invasive, there's always going to be risks. And whether or not you should go that next step and get a biopsy is something that you may have to talk about with your doctor. But just know that if someone's labs are negative, but there's still a very high suspicion based on your symptoms or based on other labs that you have Sjogren's, then you may have to talk about getting a lip biopsy. And then finally, I wanted to bring up one very important factor that I think all Sjogren's patients really need to know, and that is when you have Sjogren's syndrome, you have a higher risk of developing lymphoma. Now, I don't say this to scare you, but I think it's very important that you're aware of this association. Now, the nuances and the different types of lymphoma is honestly out of my level of expertise as a rheumatologist. But just know that oftentimes lymphoma can present as fatigue or fevers or the development of very large, very hard, very non-mobile lymph nodes. And so those can develop under the jawline, under the armpit, or in the groin. Now, Getting lymph nodes that flare up on us is actually very common just in life and very common when you have an autoimmune condition. If they move around, if they are a little tender when you touch them and they kind of come and go, that's not as worrisome as when they're hard, when they're kind of stuck and you can't really move them, and when they're not particularly tender. If that's happening and you have Sjogren's, I recommend that you go see your doctor as soon as possible. The other thing is, in my experience, I have, I have found that a lot of patients with Sjogren's, once they wrap their head around the diagnosis and they're on the right treatments and they're seeing their eye doctor and they're seeing their dentist, sometimes the rheumatologist kind of falls off. And, you know, it's like, why do I need to go see the rheumatologist? I just wait an hour in their waiting room just to get told that I'm fine. Like, they just kind of forget. And 
hey, totally fair. But it's this risk of lymphoma that really makes it important that all Sjogren's patients continue at least once every six months or once every eight to 12 months, check in with either their rheumatologist or their primary care doctor just to see how things are going, do a good once over physical exam, and make sure that there's nothing else that's developed. All right, so those were my top five things about Sjogren's syndrome. I hope you got some, some good, solid, basic understanding about Sjogren's, kind of understand what it is, why it can be so frustrating to finally get to a diagnosis, and hopefully now you are armed with some information that you can then apply to your own condition, come up with some questions and some talking points that you can bring up between you and your doctor. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe here at Connected Rheumatology. We talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because it is all connected. Thanks and have a great day.